Oh, I want to share with you this morning a truth in God's Word that if it doesn't put a smile on your face, then you need to get saved. I kid you not. The Scripture says in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 8, For by grace you have been saved through faith. It is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are the workmanship created in Christ Jesus, His workmanship. We were created for what? Good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Hallelujah. To know, man, that it's not by anything that I do that I get to have a relationship with the creator of the universe. It's simply because he's just good. Can you just say God is good? I love that. Because your religion tells you you got to do, 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 do. Jesus says, I did, did, did. It's done. Don't you love that? I love gifts that are free with no strings attached. And man, salvation is just that it's like Jesus going, there's no way. There's, you can't jump through the hoops. You can't. Here, I'm going to give you the law so you can try and get completely discouraged and frustrated. You know, that's what really makes the gift special when you see you can't obtain it on your own. That's why we get together. As the writers of Hebrews says, to stir up love and good works. See, salvation is something that we get not of good works, but it's a salvation that produces good works. The Bible says that we're his workmanship or his poetry. That's amazing. God just says, you're, you're my masterpiece. What do you do with a masterpiece? Oh, man, you, you don't put it in the basement, Right? You put it somewhere where everyone can see it and man be blessed. When Jesus created you and saved you, he says, oh, I want you to shine. I'm going to dress you in wedding white. I'm going to take off all the filthy rags and all the guilt and self-righteousness and fear, all the stuff that doesn't reflect me. And I'm going to paint something beautiful with the blood of my son. Oh, perfect. Perfect. Can you say you're perfect? You are the sight of Father God. Perfect. And He wants us to shine these good works, and it's all because of this incredible gift He gave us, and it's done through good works. See, all too often someone hears the idea of being a Christian, and, and I've been there. You go, oh, I don't want to be a Christian. Those goody two-shoes, and they just holier-than-thou people, and, and they do, do. No, 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 no. It's when you're in love with Jesus, you don't have to do anything. You get to do it. You get to live for Jesus. You get to be holy. Oh, you get to be like dad. How cool is that, right? That's the, the good works. The work is to believe. The work of God singularly Jesus it is to believe. But those who believe or love God, they obey the commands. What commands? To be like Jesus. I want to be like him, don't you? I want to walk like Jesus walked. You know, not, not so people go, look at you, but so they can say, look at him, right? How's your walk going? How's, how's your good works walk going? What's the world seeing, you know? I mean, it's a great question to ask, right? You can always ask your spouse, how's my good works walk going? Do I look like Jesus? Do I sound like Jesus? Do I walk like Jesus? Do I think like Jesus? Do, do you sometimes you shut your eyes and think you're married to Jesus? <laughs> uh, I, 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 I ask your kids, hey, sweetheart, does, does daddy act like Jesus? <laughs> Not in, I don't know. But, it, but they'll, you'll get an honest answer from your children. You know that, right? I love that. I mean, there are times where I get a prayer request from a children's ministry worker, specifically a couple weeks ago, someone came to me and says, so-and-so says they need prayer for their parents because they're always yelling at each other. Just a little kid, right? It's like, 
our kids, they need to see the good works. They need to see the, the, the masterpiece of what Jesus died that you and I could be, right? And, and we're all at different places. You know, when Jesus talked about, about the moment of this gift of salvation that we receive it, he likened to that moment and that gift as, as a seed, right? It's a seed. It's the gospel. It's the truth. And, and he says, you know, some of that seed, it kind of falls on the shaky soil and starts to sprout up, but then the sun comes and, and it dies and it never really took root. It was just going through the motions. And, you know, and he goes through these different you know, analogies, but he, but he said about those that really are saved. I love this verse in Mark 4, 8. He says, other seed fell on good soil and it came up and grew and produced a crop, some multiplying 30, some 60, and some a hundred times. What kind of produce is going on in your walk with Jesus, you know? You know, what's the world seeing? Or how fruity are you, right? You know, we, we just, we can always ask, like I said, the, the relatives and, and the family and the kids and whatnot, or even our boss, you know, we can, our coworkers, our attitude, and we can, do I reflect what it, you think Jesus would act like, you know? And, but a self-examination is really a great place to start. And one of the ways I like to kind of examine my walk of good works, if it really is reflecting the true gift of salvation, is I like to look at four particular groups of people in the Bible. There was a group of 70 disciples that Jesus sent out to share the gospel. Well, that's one group, the group of 70. There's another group, the group of 12, you know those, right? The disciples. The other group was the group of three. That was Peter, James, and John. That was, well, that was a group of three guys that it seemed to always be with Jesus when things were going really intense, like something powerful was happening, and, and they always just seemed to be in the hot spot. Peter, James, you know, the Mount of Transfiguration, for example, right? I mean, how cool it must have been to have been one of the three. But my favorite is the group of one. That's the Apostle John. He wrote about himself in the Gospel of John, the disciple whom Jesus loved. He believed he was Jesus' favorite. I hope you do too. John was the one that there at the Last Supper, oh, he's not over there talking, arguing doctrine, or trying to show off spiritual authority or a corporate ladder climbing in the church. He just, I just want to be next to you, Jesus. I want to sit next to you, and I want to rest my head in your bosom. I want to hear your heart. I want to hear your, ah, oh, the group of one. Kind of where, where do you think you're at? You know, in, in your walk, in your production of the fruit that real salvation is supposed to just produce the 70 the 12 the three the one i wrote down a couple of thoughts about these four groups and i want to share them with you consider this the group of 70 these are a group of disciples saved maybe maybe not hard to tell not a salvation you want to rest in the group of 70 they live a conditional and sporadic in devotion they love god from a distance the obedience is seasonal and self-serving to appease guilty conscience. For, for example, in other words, I really should read my Bible. I, I, I guess I feel terrible I haven't done that. I haven't been to church in a month. We really, really should, let, you know, let's, let's do God a favor. Let's go today. I know I really shouldn't yell like that. It's, it's wrong. And, but, but the conviction is more of a moral thing than it is I'm connected to the heart of God and, and it hurt him and therefore it hurts me. The 70 doesn't really experience that true type of intimacy. And on the outside, it can look like Christianity, but it might, it might not be. There will be some that are part of the group of 70 that will stand before Jesus and he'll say, away from me, I never knew you. And they're going to say, but I did. I was one of the 70 and I went out and I preached the gospel and I, and I prayed over people and they got healed. And he's going to say, I never knew who you were. There's some of the 70 in this room. But on a happier note, there's the group of 12 disciples. This group definitely saved, and they live in daily communion with Christ. This group has committed everything they are and that they have to Jesus as Savior and Lord. Yet, 
They're lacking personal revelation and they feel that they are second string in the kingdom of God. And, you know, I, I'm one of the 12, I love Jesus, I'm committed, I've, lost, I've left everything, but, but there's, I look at other people as the superstars in the body of Christ and, uh, and you know, like Peter, James, and John, I'm, I, I'm with Jesus, I'm committed, but I'm not like them. And if you're part of the 12, you have a tendency at times to kind of like, I don't know, elevate those that are really being used by God in a way that you admire and let's just face it, idolize. Could that be you? Hmm. The group of three, well, that's Peter, James, and John. We talked about them, right? They were always with Jesus when something really cool was happening in the Gospels, right? The group of three, definitely saved, live in daily communion with Christ, finds the supernatural life as natural. I mean, they're just always seeing God do stuff like, man, he's healing people, raising people from the dead, prophetic words and confirmations coming left and right. They're just powerful supernatural stuff that just is a daily occurrence, it seems like. They believe that Jesus wants fellowship with them all the time. Yet, this group has a tendency to choose doing for God over being with God. This group will at times walk on water and yet sink in the sin of self-confidence. I think a lot of us in this room, beginning the one talking to you right now, can relate to that group, no doubt. Especially that latter part about sinking in the sin of self-confidence. But group one, this is where we always want to be, right? I think, I think a lot of us here, we kind of like teeter-totter back and forth in group three and group one. Group one, oh... John, saved, lives in daily communion with Christ. If you're part of this group, you will not go anywhere or say anything without Jesus leading you. You would rather be alone with Jesus than in a stadium filled with worshipers. You joyfully choose the voice of God within fiery trials over a painless season that His voice is silent. You believe you can do nothing apart from the power of God. You live so close to the heart of God, you appear to be Jesus in skin to everyone you encounter. Oh man, how about living like that all the time, right? Just so close with Jesus that it's just, you're like a walking incarnation of the Lord. I mean, that's what Christians are, little Jesuses, right? That's what we're supposed to be. See, salvation comes with such an invitation to group one. When you're born again and you're filled with the divine nature of God, you're invited to sit next to Him at the table. You're invited to go up to the Mount of Transfiguration. You're invited. You might not think you are. You might be listening to lies of insecurity, to wounds and misrepresentations of the Lord in your life that, that misrepresent the heart of the shepherd towards you, and then you buy into it and you become part of the group of the 70 or the 12. But Man, if you're born again, I love this. In Revelation 2, it says, To him who overcomes will sit on my throne with me. It's like, wow, so your lap is big enough for all your kids? Yes. Remember when they were arguing, who will sit at your right hand? I don't want to sit at his right hand. I want to sit on his lap. <laughs> Amen? It's like, you know, he's got room for all of us in this perfect group one. And see, he showed up in John 20 after he had purchased their salvation, yours, mine, and, and he breathed upon them and said, come on, church, receive the Holy Spirit, right? They believed in Jesus as Messiah, but they had not received the divine nature of God, Emmanuel, come to live in them, you see. But see, something happened after that moment. He proceeded to spend the next 40 days preaching the promises of a powerful gift that would be the rocket fuel in their spiritual journey on earth. That's what the book of Acts is about. They were born again. They received this salvation. They weren't really manifesting the good works or the shining masterpiece that's supposed to be the overflow of it. There was, well, a block. Kind of like when you, you, you're trying to remember somebody's name. It's in there. You just have a hard time getting it out. You ever been there? If you haven't, just wait. <laughs> I'm 52. Happens all the time. So when I say, hey, brother, sister, I forgot who you are. I shouldn't say that because I get myself in trouble, but I don't care. <laughs> Not all the time. Sometimes I do remember. But point is, it's, just, it's inside you, but you're just trying to get it out. That's, that's what happens when we get saved. There's this power. 
There's this divine nature of Jesus that's living inside us, wanting to get out and be that masterpiece, right? But there's a block. And so Jesus says, okay, here we are, John 20, you're saved. I'm going to spend the next 40 days, and I'm going to talk to you, and I, I'm going to stir something up in you. It's called love. <laughs> I'm so glad that God stirs up love in me. How about you? I mean, when, when you see a picture of the cross, or maybe you come up forward and you grab the cup and the bread, does that stir up love for you? It really stirs up love for me. When I come hold the cup and I go, wow, you did this for me, Jesus. And, and I hold the bread, you did this for me. Oh, it stirs up love. Whew. Like, wow, Lord. And you know what you know what happens when love is stirred up? Good works. Dude, holiness. A life like Jesus. It, it's a reflex, right? It's not something, mm, good works. I need good works. That's what some Christians are like, right? They, they look like they're constipated or something. They're, they're trying to, you know, they're trying to live a holy life and it, it, it doesn't work. You know, good works is just this overflow, this reflex because Jesus has stirred up this love and this overflow of the divine nature of a holy God that lives in you and me. And so he says, I'm going to take the next 40 days and, and I'm going to spend time with you. And, and a guy named Luke, he, he was a Greek, so he's a Gentile, a doctor, mind you. And he writes, and I'm so grateful the Holy Spirit inspired him to give the story of what happened these 40 days that, that Jesus says, here's the gift, but it needs to be stirred up so it overflows with the masterpiece of good work so people can see me and not you. Because you can have the divine nature in you, but just be the 70 and loving me from a distance. And your devotion is seasonal. Right? And so Dr. Luke, who, who he understands, see, doctors were actually usually slaves. We didn't, you might not know that, but, but Luke, it was widely believed that he was a slave to the individual he writes, Theophilus, a, a, a Roman official. And, and history tells us that basically Theophilus gave Luke his freedom. And what Luke chose to do with his freedom was write the Gospel of Luke. <laughs> And, and he sent it to Theophilus. Then after that, he's going to write the book of Acts. And that's where we're at. And he starts off with this precious 40 days of Jesus stirring up the gift of salvation inside his sons and daughters. My prayer is that as you hear this, oh, that you get stirred up. Are you feeling it? You know, we don't want that chocolate at the bottom of the glass. You've got to stir it up, right? I'm going back into my childhood, arrested development, right? I, we just we want to bring the sweetness to the top. We don't want it buried down. It, it's like, that's well, God said, I don't want that. I want it to come out. I don't want your cup just full. I want it overflowing. So I'm going to speak to you. Oh, Luke gives this account. I love it. And, and the heart is, see, Jesus wants the whole church to be group one. That's the agenda. That's the mission everybody's supposed to be group one, not group 70, not group 12, not group three, group one. Make them one. Hmm. Acts 1, check this out. Awesome. The former account I made, which was the gospel of Luke, O oh, Theophilus, all that Jesus began to do and to teach. That's what a good shepherd does, right? He, he does, just doesn't tell you. He does it and shows you and then teaches you. That's our good shepherd, Jesus. All to do and to teach until the day in which he was taken up. After he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Wow. This had to be amazing, right? I mean, first of all, life is over with. Jesus is dead. Everyone wants to kill you. And then he appears in the midst of a room with closed doors. Shalom, <laughs> right? It's like, I talk about a drama. I would feel like I'm just like, I've got some type of chemical imbalance in my brain because I'm, I'm, my life is over with. <gasps> there you are, right? right? It, and, and then all of a sudden I get saved and now Jesus is going to spend 40 days talking about what? The things pertaining to the kingdom. Kingdom. And, and, and this is fascinating to me. He does it for 40 days. 
40 is an interesting number, isn't it? 40, it's a significant number in the Bible. Put that up on the screen. It's called the walk of 40 in the Bible. It always connects to trials, testing, and preparation. These are just a few. There's a couple more that I didn't put in here, but there's quite a few in the Bible. Noah watched it rain for 40 days. Moses left Egypt at the age of 40. Moses waited in the desert for 40 more years after that. And then when he was 80, I didn't add this in, then for 40 years he led Israel, right? Moses fasted for 40 days. Israel wandered for 40 years. The three kings of Israel, Saul, David, and Solomon, that was the three kings before the kingdom divided. They all reigned for exactly 40 years. Ezekiel laid on his side for 40 days, a symbolism bearing the sins of Judah. Jesus fasted and was tempted in the desert for 40 days. Jesus was flogged, 40 lashes minus one. And Jesus, as we just read, spoke to his disciples for 40 days in a resurrected body. So here Jesus comes to complete all that was in the law and the prophets. He comes along and he says, here you want to talk about trial and tribulation and preparation. I've come to speak to you about the things of the kingdom of God. That's why we come here to have Jesus in our midst and have him speak to us about the things of the kingdom of God. It says in verse 4 that being assembled together with them, so here's Jesus with roughly 120 disciples. He commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Now, I find this fascinating and and typical because Jesus says, hey, I got this gift, this deposit, the Holy Spirit, John 14. He was with you. You got saved. He came in you, John 20. You got saved, but he's going to be upon you. That's the power. That's the overflow. And it's going to happen. And and that's, that's exciting, don't you think? And their response is, hmm, power, awesome. So are you going to give us power to overcome Rome? Cool. Now see, there's some prophetic insights to the coming of Messiah with the restoration of Israel. So we can give him a kind of a partial break. That There's some validity to question the fulfillment of prophecy there. But when you look at the rest of the chapter and the carnality that follows, no, it, it's really more about a self-serving idea of what the power of God is for, which I find a lot of people do today. Man, give me the anointing. Give me joy so I can be happy. You know, give me the gift of prophecy so I can be respected by people in the church. <laughs> you know, we, we, we want this power, but that's not, that's not the reason for the power. You hear me? God doesn't give us power or an anointing or an overflow of his man of his presence so we can be rock stars in the church. That ain't it. Now, that's many times what blocks that power is, is idolatry. We want to use the things of God to draw attention to ourselves. This was Lucifer's problem in heaven. Simon the sorcerer, the seven sons of Sceva. I, need I go on? And so Jesus is wanting them to wait because there's a purification going on. Did we say something about 40 days? Yeah. 40 days. There's trial, tribulation, preparation, purification going on in this waiting time so they have the right heart. Because, see, God doesn't want to give you, as a three-year-old, a Ferrari. Not a good idea. Not a good idea. He, he, he's not looking to use you. He wants to bless you. And to give a three-year-old Ferrari is not blessing them. It's abuse. So he's wanting to wait because he's doing a work here. So he responds to the question that they are the response there. In verse 7, he says, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power. Dunamis. We get that word dynamics or dynamite from that. You shall receive dynamite, dynamic power. Does that look like your walk with Jesus? Dynamite, dynamic power. And I'm not talking about just for the spiritual manifestations we read about in Corinthians. I'm talking about the greatest power of all to actually have the fruit of the Spirit, to love God and love people. Oh, man, because people are tough to love. 
Can I get an amen? <laughs> it's just challenging, right? But when you see this dynamite, dynamic power, it's like they shall know you by the love you have for one another. How can we do that? Dynamic, dynamite power from the Holy Spirit. And he's saying, I, I have this from you. So stop worrying about arguing eschatology and end time prophetic events, doctrine. Just It's not about knowing. It's about being. Can you say that with me? It's not about knowing. It's about being. If you're busy about knowing, you will not walk in dynamic, dynamite power, baptism of the Holy Spirit. You won't. You can very well be saved, but you're a head case. You're all into knowing, as they were. Hmm. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Notice he didn't say in you. Holy Spirit was already in them. He was already there. But he's working. Things are being stirred up. When he comes upon you, you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the, all the ends of the earth. Think about this. He says, I don't want you to think about what you know. I want you to be my witnesses. This word witnesses is the same word for martyr. This does not sound like a promotion. It says in verse 10, when they had spoken these things while they watched, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly towards heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel who also said, men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go in to heaven. Wow. Why are you just standing there? Two angels come to minister. I'm so glad God sends angels to minister. Sometimes we don't see them because they're ministering spirits. The Bible says in Hebrews, but it also tells us that we've entertained angels unaware, so they can also come in a human form and appear as a man or a woman or a child, who knows? But God sends two angels because they're not walking, they're standing. You'll never experience the baptism of the Holy Spirit by standing. You've got to walk. Come on. You've got to move. And he comes and says, what are you doing here? Now, and I'm sure they're kind of stunned, you know, but the angels, if I could hear them just talk, I, I'd say something else. I'd hear them say something along the lines of, you know, you weren't saved to stand in fear, but to walk in faith. You're standing in shock. He, he was gone. He appeared. You've had 40 awesome days camping with Jesus and having fish by the Sea of Galilee. It's been amazing, speaking things that just blew your mind, and now he's gone again. But bigger than that, he told you that your job title and description is a martyr. Now let's put this together. Jesus says, I've got power for you. You're going to need it because... You're going to die. And I want you to die like I died. I want you to walk the life that I walked because you can't share in my glory, my son, unless you share in my suffering. Now, if I'm one of the disciples and I'm listening to Jesus, this is what's going through my mind. Jesus, I watched you die for me. I watched you shed your blood for me. I watched you suffer more than anything I've ever heard of, much less seen, and you did it for me. If I'm Peter, I remember looking directly in your eyes as I brought curses down on you, denying you. If I'm Peter, I remember how you restored me with such love and mercy and grace. And now, Jesus, you're standing before me, and you're telling me you want me to die for you. How do you say no? How can you say no to that? If you're really blown away by what he did, you can't say no. Your heart would be 
I would be more than happy to die for you, Jesus. But I watched how you died, and I'm not sure that I can be on a cross and be spit upon and say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. I'm not sure I can suffer and turn down the wine mixed with myrrh, the gall, the some type of drug to numb me from the pain. I, I think I might medicate when times get tough. I'm not sure I can be on the cross like you did in life. I'm going to need power to do this. And Jesus says, I'm going to give you power. But yet there's some Christians not experiencing this glorious power, right? Power that just, man, you love people. You forgive people. You're able really able to turn the other cheek. You could forgive someone without them even asking for them to forgive you. I mean, how often do we do that? We usually go, they haven't said they're sorry. Right? Aren't you so glad Jesus wasn't like that while we were yet sinners? He was dying for us. It's such power to love to bear our sins on the cross. Oh man, this is the power that Jesus offers to us. But see, before we really get jazzed about a gift, we have to really see the need for the gift. So if someone's going to tell me, if Jesus is going to say, Dave, I'm going to send you back to minister and snatch people from the fire, the very thing I did for you, I'm going to do through you. And you're going to be persecuted, even some of you murdered for it. Will you go? But before you go, I'm going to give you this power where there'll be joy in the midst of fiery trials. In the midst of no matter how many people reject you, you'll be hearing my heart and my breath upon you every moment. I'll stand with you. If they string you up around a pole and light a fire, there'll be a sweet smell of aroma in the air as you worship me. But you'll need my power to do that. Oh. The disciples didn't have that power yet. See, Acts chapter 1 is justifiably called the Acts of the Disciples because what you see is carnality, you see compromise, you see them anointing and laying hands and cat rolling the dice for Matthias to be the disciple instead of who I believe it to be should have been the Apostle Paul, that they're just not really in the Spirit. See, nowhere in the book of Acts does it call it the Acts of the Apostles, it's a good enough name, I guess, but I think really what it should be is Acts chapter 1 should be the Acts of the Apostles, but Acts chapter 2 through 28 should be the Acts of the Holy Spirit, <laughs> right? It's just because what you see happen is when they receive this power of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2, it's no longer them living. It's Christ living in them and through them, and all you see is Jesus. You don't see spirit of fear, carnality, compromise, religion. Oh, no, 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 no. You see the kingdom of heaven flowing in and through their lives. It's incredible, right? I mean, you look at the lives of the, the apostles. Man, these guys went from being people that were like, you know, they get saved in John 20. They go fishing. They catch nothing. They're rolling dice and gambling in chapter 1, who's going to be the apostle. They go from that to being these hardcore, sold-out, radical, bananas in love with Jesus for the rest of their life to the point they died proclaiming their faith. I mean, look at this chart up here. This is the 12 apostles, including Matthias as well. Andrew, crucified. Bartholomew, beaten, then crucified. Uh, James and Alphaeus, stoned to death. And as you go down all these, you go, wow, they were stoned, speared, Peter, crucified, upside down. You look at all this, the source from the Fox's Book of Martyrs, which you can read, and uh, it's some intense stuff about these guys. I kind of referenced Polycarp, which was one of the church fathers, when I talked about where if, if God would allow you to be tied to a stake. And, and Polycarp, that actually happened to him in the church of Smyrna, which means myrrh. He was one of the church fathers in Smyrna, one of the churches in the uh, seven churches in Revelation. And they actually tied him. And, and, and as he was burning, he was worshiping, and they shoved a spear in his side. Water came out, and an incense, an aroma filled the whole area where they were murdering him. It's all in the Fox's Book of Mars. But this guy was so filled with the Holy Spirit, so in love with God, and walking in the power of God, that he was just a picture of God. He couldn't have done that without dynamic, dynamite power. Oh, man, and Jesus offers that? I don't know about you. I want that. How about you? 
See, here's the thing. Before God can really give you something, he has to strip you of something. You with me? He's got to strip you of the most painful thing, you. <laughs> it's Because it's, we, we love us, right? I mean, just clock yourself for a week how much you look in the mirror, and you'll know what I'm talking about. We, we just, we, you know, how many times you're looking in the refrigerator or looking in the mirror or watching the TV. It's like we just love us. But Jesus wants to strip us of our confidence to provide for us, to medicate us, to bring ourselves peace. And when we're stripped of that, then when there's nothing left, we're hungry for the only thing that will provide and satisfy, which is the power of God the presence of God. And, and that's where these disciples are at, if you think about it. Prior to this incredible, glorious swan song we read about in their lives, prior to that, they're going, wow, Jesus was dead, we were outcast, we were hunted, and then he showed up, we thought everything was great, good, Jesus, you're back, you're going to overthrow Rome, you're a resurrected body, oh, we're back in the king's entourage, yes, and then he leaves again, and on top of it, he tells us we're going to be martyrs. I, I'm going crazy, I'm one of the disciples. The only hope they have is to get power from God. That's it. If they don't get the same supernatural power that raised Jesus from the dead, there is no hope for their lives. How will we eat? No one will give us a job. No one will buy our fish. No one will buy our wife's things that she does because we're considered a cult. We're outcast in the synagogue. We've been stripped of our religion. We've been stripped of our friends. We've been stripped of whatever money we can make. We get stripped of false confessions of who we think we are in Jesus, but we're really not in atmospheres like that. And then all that's left is a promise Jesus has for us. Now that promise is looking better than it ever has before because there's nothing else left. And he's bringing us to a place, listen closely, he's bringing us to a place where we will stop thinking about knowing what it is to be a Christian, knowing Jesus, and start being Jesus in skin. It's not for you to know how everything is going to work out. It's about you being my witness, being my martyr. I don't want you to like do forgiveness. I want you to be forgiveness. I don't want you to love people. I want you to be love. The embodiment, the incarnation of who I am. That's what I want you to be. You can't do it without power. We were made to be little walking, talking Jesuses. Do you know that? I went to a concert some years ago, and some of you probably remember this. One of the speakers came up, and he get, get, brought this picture up on the screen. Look at this. I love this. It's a cohesive molecule and our, every one of our bodies has it. It's called laminin. And it, it, it's basically the molecule that holds everything in our bodies together. If you took this molecule out of our body, you would just be mud and water on the ground. If you remove that one molecule. And here they have this microscopic view of this molecule called laminin, and it looks like a cross. Are you kidding me? Talk about Jesus holds all things together, Colossians 1, right? He's holding us together. And to think that my, yours, our DNA is the actual picture of the cross of Calvary. And he says, you shall be my martyrs. You watched me do it. You watched me walk the Calvary road. You watched me bleed in prayer in the garden and say, not my will, but your will be done. You watched me stand before Caiaphas and be silent as a lamb before it shears because I put my trust in him who judges justly. You watched me do that. You watched me on the cross, the seven sayings of the cross, a whole other Bible study. Look it up. Powerful insight to what it means to be not know, but to be the cross, to be the empty tomb. He says, with my power, you can be a walking cross of Calvary. You can be the power of the empty tomb that takes dead things and makes it alive, beginning with you. You can do that. It's in your, it's in your genetics. It's in your bloodline. But you need an anointing to stir it up. The Apostle Paul had such an anointing. Galatians 2 says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Somebody say amen. Oh, that verse is so beautiful because the Apostle Paul's going, man, it's not me. It's Jesus in me. My life has been 
stripped away from me. And that's what Jesus did. He stripped Paul of everything. He was part of the Sanhedrin, right? Part of the, the Jewish Supreme Court, if you would. Uh, the, the, the most powerful district attorney ever in the history of Israel, if you would, is so much power and authority, and Jesus strips him of everything, even his sight. But what does he give him in place? An ear to hear the heart of Messiah, an ear to hear the voice of Messiah, and a capacity to be filled with the very presence and power of God like never before. Well, that's a good trade-off, but you notice the stripping preceded the gifting. It can be summed up in one statement. What can be summed up? The atmosphere that is prepared to receive. That 40 days of preparation that brings a person where they're stripped and ready to see God move in dynamite, dynamic power. And it comes by a person being humble enough to go, I can't. Can you say it out loud? I can't. You can't stop there, though. Then you got to go, but my God who lives in me can. And through me, he will. Come on, somebody say amen. amen. It's like when you get to that place, see, receiving the power of God, I promise you, you don't need to come forward, and I don't need to sprinkle some water on you. I don't need to anoint you with oil. I don't even need to lay hands on you. But what you have to do is come to a place where you go, I can't. I can't do the Christian walk. I can't be faithful in prayer. I can't be faithful to love people. I can't be faithful in fellowship. I can't be faithful in giving. I'm naturally greedy. I can't. I can't be sacrificial like that. Amen. You can't. But so often we stop at the I can't and we live in guilt and self-motivation and human behavior modification in the church. We come and we do the stuff and we present hypocrisy to a world that doesn't really see what Jesus or Christianity really looks like. But when someone gets stripped and they joyfully confess, I cannot, but my God who lives in me can, he promised. He promised there'd be power in me and he'd live that life out through me. And I know he's about to do just that. Oh, you are primed and ready for Acts chapter 2. You're primed and ready for a suddenly moment where the Holy Spirit comes in the room and disrupts everything in your life in a way that you initially won't like too much, but then you'll find out the disruptions were needed, and he was making room for future glory. God is in to supplying our needs, family. It's not like we're some person that's just joined the Air Force and we're part of the kingdom to soar high for the kingdom of God, and, and we walk in, and he goes, well... Great, I'm glad you're in the Air Force, but you, you need to build your own jet and build your own plane and provide your own fuel and the whole thing. I mean, uh, that would be very discouraging if you enlisted in the Air Force, right? The idea is you enlist and it's all provided. That's the way it is in the kingdom of God. You enlist, you get saved, God's got the rocket ship. God's got the fuel. He's got it all. He provides for it all. All you have to say is, I can't provide. I can do it, but my God who lives in me can, and my God through me, he will. He's about to. And you might not be believing that. You might be sitting back going, I know God provides, but he provides for group one. He provides for group three, and, and sometimes group 12, but I'm in group 70, so I'm sure he's done. I'm not really on God's radar. You've been lied to? Oh my gosh, you've been lied to. If you've got the blood covering you, if you've got the Spirit of God inside you, you're group one. You just might not be living it. You're not experiencing it. So let me share something with you to encourage you that would help you. Listen to this. Isaiah 40, verse 29, the scripture says, he gives power to the weak. Anybody qualified to receive that today? <laughs> he gives power to the weak and to those who have no might. He increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary and the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait, doesn't that sound like Acts chapter 1? Oh, but those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Oh, Lord. I'm ready. I confess I can't. But my God who lives in me, he can. And through me, come on, he will. How do I know? Because he promised he would. 
He promised. He said, I've got power for you. You're weak. I'm strong. Once you see how weak you are, you'll really be open to my strength in your life. In closing, folks, this is why Jesus said in Luke 11, he was preparing the disciples. He was, he was planting seed for Acts chapter 1. Now, I want you to know this. In Luke 11, some two years before we read Acts chapter 1, Jesus was preparing them a mindset for this moment. What would go on in their waiting on the Lord for their strength? What I'm about to read to you, it could be a major paradigm shift in your life today. So before I even read this to you, I, I just want to say this. I know some of you here are discouraged in your walk with Jesus. You're discouraged in your Christianity. You're trying to figure out and to know how to do this. It's not for you to know how it works out and how you do it. It's for you to be. And the only way you will be is to go, I can't be. But you can be the cross and empty tomb in me. And you will through me because your word says, and that's where I'm waiting. And that's where I'm not just standing. That's where I'm going to walk, you see. That's when I was baptized in the Holy Spirit. I'd been saved a good year and a half. I love the Lord, but I was somewhere in between the 70 group and the 12. Inconsistent. Carnal, spiritual sometimes, back and forth. But man, when I got, and I didn't speak in tongues. For some of you who are on that trip, you're going, oh, that did you? No, I don't think that is the sign of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I think the sign is the power to walk as Jesus walked with consistency and stability and spirituality where people go, you look like Jesus. That's the idea where they see the cross, they see the empty tomb. And man, at that point, everything changed. I was crazy, radically in love with Jesus. I wasn't asking for the Holy Spirit to be overflowing in my life. I was just praying for someone to get saved and I knew I couldn't save somebody. So I was asking for something I had no confidence in that I could do. That's the key. What is it in your life right now that you're going, I'm trying to do and I need to stop and just let him be? What is it? Is it overcoming lust? Is it repairing your marriage? Is it just having a heart to want to want to be with God? What is it? Confess that you can't. That's all you got to do. I'm weak. He's strong. Unless the Lord builds the house, we're building shacks. They're just going to fall down, right? So the Holy Spirit has been provided to do it all. That's why God gets all the glory. Jesus says, I tell you, keep on asking. Keep on asking. Oh, see, for 40 days. How long is your 40 days? Your 40 days could be 41 days. It could be two years. It could be two weeks. I don't know. But as long as it takes, keep on asking. Because you're going through a 40-day preparation. So keep on asking. And you will receive what you ask for. Now, what's he talking about? Well, context is key. Keep reading. Keep on seeking and you will find. Find what? Keep on knocking and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives. Everyone who seeks finds. Receives what? Finds what? Everyone who knocks, the door will be open. Your fathers, if your children ask for a fish, do you give them a snake instead? Or if you ask for an egg, do you give them a scorpion? Of course not. So if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Dad just says, ask me. Ask. You could say, I have. Keep asking. Keep seeking. Keep knocking. If it hasn't happened, it's because you're being stripped of you. You still think you can do it. That's the block. You still think you can live the Christian life. And as long as you think 
you can do it, he's going to let you try. How long must that go on? This week in our home groups, family, I want you to come with a heart of transparency. Come with a heart to go, I know I can't live the Christian life. I cannot. I will fail miserably. I need Jesus to do it through me. And I want to come and spend time with brothers and sisters because I want to have the heart that they had in Acts 2 that says, I can't live the Christian life, but my God who lives in me can, and through me he will. It's not about just confessing that I can't. It's about taking a stand that he promised that he's going to and coming together with the people of God and saying, man, I'm going to pray over you. I'm going to love you. I'm going to encourage you. God gives power to the weak. He does it through his people too. He'll speak a word of encouragement through someone in that group into your life. So I want you to ponder on this relationship with the Holy Spirit. Jesus talked about this a lot, did he not? It must be really important. I believe it's the key of why the church today is not all in group one. It is the reason. There's no other reason. We're just not submitted to the power of God. We're trying to mix our strength with His. If you will humble yourself and joyfully confess your inadequacies, oh my gosh, I said I was going to end and I'm not. I'm sorry, forgive me. I, 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 I've got to read one more scripture because this is going, I promise you, you stand to your feet. That way it'll kind of help me. Yeah. <laughs> Because I wasn't going to share the scripture, but I'm like, man, this is just so good. Because remember how I said, when God calls you and he wants to anoint you, he has to strip you, right? Now, see, we've all got stuff about us that we just don't like. Insecurities, things, and I want you to know every one of them are a gift from God. insecurities are a gift from God. Weaknesses are a gift from God. Yeah, a thorn in the flesh that was a messenger of Satan to keep Paul humble was a gift from God. God gives gifts that don't feel good, but they have a purpose, but they're being used to strip us of us so we can confess, I can't, but my God who lives in me can and through me he will. How do we get there? Look at this with the life of Moses. Oh, this is so beautiful. God is sending him like he was sending, Jesus was sending the disciples and Moses said to the Lord in Exodus 4, Oh, my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither before nor since you have spoke to your servant, but I am slow to speech and slow of tongue. In other words, I stutter, I sound like an idiot, I don't got the greatest vocabulary, I, I just, I, I just, I'm incapable. So the Lord said to him, Who has made man's mouth? Or who makes the mute? Who makes the deaf, or the seeing, or even the blind? Have not I the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be with your mouth, and teach you what you shall say. God says, even if you're mute and blind, I've ordained it for a reason, because in your weakness, I'm going to be strong. But as long as you're saying it can't happen because of something you have or don't have, you haven't been stripped of you yet. Father, we welcome you to strip us of us. We welcome you, God, to come and open our eyes to the revelation that you alone are God, that Jesus, you alone can live the Christian life. Every one of us in this room have a record of miserable failures trying to be spiritual. We have broken relationships, diseases, bankruptcies, bitter roots, all because we tried to live it in our own strength. So we confess to you, Lord. We can't be like Jesus. Jesus, we need you to live the Calvary life, through us. So we offer ourselves to you. We confess as the disciples that Jesus, you are the Messiah. 
It is you who shed your blood for our sins. You restored fellowship with the Holy Father. We receive that this morning. And we welcome you, Spirit of the living God, not only to flood our soul, but to come and overflow in our life that the world would see the Messiah Jesus in us, through us. Lord, we confess that anything that's righteous that comes through our life is not us, it's you. So we welcome you, God, to have your way in our thought lives, in the works of our hands, Lord, in our marriages, in our bank accounts, God, in, 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 our, in our entertainment, everything in our life, Jesus, we want to be pleasing and honoring to you. So the grace by which we're saved, Holy Spirit, we welcome you to flood every soul in this place. May you fill every son of daughter to overflowing. Control our thoughts, our lives. We submit ourselves to you today, Father. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And if you believe, somebody shout amen. amen. Family, God bless you. We'll see you at one of the home groups. <laughs>